You're watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. From Toronto, Ontario, I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Today, a conversation with Amira Al Gawabi from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation about Islamophobia after the Quebec City Mosque shooting. But first, some news headlines. Ceremony held outside Quebec Mosque where 2017 shooting left six dead. Ottawa wants to return to normalcy, says Mayor Jim Watson. Sustainability events show success stories of Canadian mosques. BJP candidate highlights tensions between Muslims, Hindus in India. And now, the details. A ceremony was held outside the Islamic Cultural Centre in Quebec on the first National Day of Remembrance of the Quebec City Mosque attack and action against Islamophobia. The attendees of the mournful event remembered the six worshippers that were killed and the dozens who were injured. Ayman Jabali and Hakim Shambaz, survivors of the shooting, both recalled the terror they experienced during the incident. Quebec Premier Francois Legault and Quebec City Mayor Bruno Marchand were also in attendance. The federal government announced the appointment of a special representative to combat Islamophobia on Friday. Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson wants the Freedom Convoy to wrap up their protests so locals can return to normal life. Ottawans have been dealing with clogged roads and throngs of protesters for four days now. There are several criminal investigations underway, including one related to the desecration of the Terry Fox statue and the tomb of the unknown soldier. The convoy, which started as a no vaccine mandate for truckers, has grown into an anti-government movement calling for the removal of all pandemic related restrictions. On Sunday, Transport Minister Omar al Rabra reaffirmed the decision to impose a mandate on truck drivers. Enviro Muslims held an online event on Sunday to showcase the success stories of local Canadians who ran sustainability programs at their mosque. Nazeesh Qureshi from Calgary, as well as Mohammed Jiraj and Hashim Abdi from Ontario, told attendees about their efforts to make local mosques eco-friendly. Projects included building a garden, distributing re reusable water bottles and plates, and building a solar energy farm. The event is part of a larger collaboration with Faith and the Common Good on greening Canadian mosques. Their online toolkit allows mosques to be more efficient and has more than 50 pledges. Muslims in Matharu, India, have raised concerns after Yogi Adityanath of the right-wing Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP, highlighted disputes between Hindus and Muslims in his election campaign. Adityanath said that he will side with the Hindus over a decades-long land dispute where both a mosque and a temple stand. The dispute has resulted in violent clashes that killed dozens last year. Media sources report that Muslims living in the area have already had to close their businesses due to a recent ban on meat. They also say that tensions between Muslims in Hin and Hindus in Mataroa have escalated since the BJP has been in power. That's it for the news. On the weekend, we commemorated the shooting at the Quebec City Mosque massacre. Monuments and city halls across Canada were lit up in green. The government last year proclaimed January 29th as a day of remembrance and action against Islamophobia. All these are gratifying acts of allyship and solidarity. To talk to us about these and other aspects of Islamophobia in Canada, we welcome to the show Sister Amira El Gawabi. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Alaikum Aslam. Thank you so much, Kathy, for having me. It's a pleasure. What do you remember about the day five years ago? 
Actually, it was my uh, young daughter uh, who was uh, at the time 11 years old who actually heard that something terrible had happened at a mosque in Quebec. And I remember um, the first uh, media interview that I did uh, as uh, communications director at the National Council of Canadian Muslims was around midnight that night when we'd learned that there had been a shooting and that several Muslims had died. We didn't have much information. And of course, you know, I went through the motions of responding um, as as we would in that circumstance. But I also know that my emotions were very much of fear and also of, um, uh, you know, almost of having expected uh, due to the Islamophobic rhetoric in this country over the years that something like this could happen. And it was very sad that um, our, our worst fears had come true. It must have been difficult to do those interviews when there was still a lot of confusion. I, I remember... <clears throat> That there was a Muslim who was in the who was in the vicinity who actually was accused of the shooting, wasn't that an example of Islamophobia in action right after a, a horrific crime and tragedy like the shooting? There was a lot of confusion, and um, all we all we could comment on as it was unfolding and as the information was coming, just of course the horror of knowing that people who had been worshiping in a mosque. Um, had been killed. And so responding to that without really having the full information is, you know, was this, uh, you know, something that had been motivated by hate? Who was the shooter? Was it something, as some people were suggesting, happened from within the community? It was very confusing, as you say, Kathy. Um, but all we started to understand over time and came to know that that was an act of terror. It was an act of hate uh, and, and uh, the worst kind of manifestation of Islamophobia that we could ever see. How many days was it before things had kind of settled down in terms of knowing what had really happened? Oh, I think it, it within about 24 hours, we knew. We knew by, mm. by Monday night. So it happened on a Sunday evening. By Monday evening, we knew that this was an act of hate, uh, that it was an act of terror. And uh, there was a vigil actually on Parliament Hill that night, just as there were vigils across the province of Quebec and other places. Um, and um, it was, yeah, it was a huge shock for, for fellow Canadians and, of course, for our communities. Um, you know, as I said, uh, this, this was something that many people who are, were paying attention to the Islamophobic rhetoric in Canada, uh, whether it was the Naqab ban, um, the, around the citizenship oath, whether it was, uh, quote unquote, barbaric cultural practices, whether it was all the negative narratives around Syrian refugees. And it's really important to remember that that weekend of the attack on that Friday afternoon before it, um, Donald Trump had, a then president, had actually signed into law or, um, or a decree, a presidential degree, the Muslim, the quote unquote Muslim ban. And then mm. Saturday morning, uh, our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, tweeted out a message of welcome and solidarity and inclusion. And from what we've learned from court documents, the shooter, who will I will not name to give him that, that um, attention, but the shooter saw that tweet and felt that he had to take matters into his own hands because of all the negative narratives that he'd been consuming online about Muslims. He felt that he had to protect his family from, uh, from our communities. And that's what motivated him to finally uh, commit the act that he had been uh, premeditating on for quite some time before. You were with the National Council of Canadian Muslims, as you mentioned, communication director at the time, and now you're with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. And I assume that it's very similar kind of work. You're trying to work against racism, against Islamophobia. And you've just mentioned now the story of the shooter uh, being kind of enraged or inflamed by a welcoming tweet. How, how do you go about your work uh, in terms of countering the rise of this hateful rhetoric in Canada? Yeah, I mean, it is similar work because whatever form of racism and hatred that we're fighting against, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, um, uh, anti-Indigenous racism, whatever form of discrimination that we're dealing with, essentially it all comes from the same poisonous tree. It is based in ignorance. It is based in fear mongering and otherization. And certainly we know that the online space has become uh, in some quarters a cesspool of, of hatred. And so what, we, what we're trying to do with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation really is building relationships with the different communities, empowering people to have conversations, not only about 
individual acts of hate that people may be exposed to um, in all of the various forms that it can happen, whether it's the day-to-day -day discrimination we might be facing or whether it's actual violence and harassment, um, but also how do we dismantle systemic uh, racism? How do we look at institutions and work together to dismantle those barriers? The Prime Minister Trudeau was at the funeral of the of the uh, those who died in the shooting and other ministers and, and um, dignitaries, but they didn't proclaim the day of remembrance until last year, which was four years later. So how do you kind of assess or how satisfied are you with how the governments are responding? I think it's really important to understand something that it takes time for society and the broader general public to understand the significance of different forms of racism or hate. So I'll give you a quick, quick example. The Polytechnique massacre, uh, which happened in 1989 in Montreal, where um, uh, 14 women were killed by an individual who was angry that women had uh, gone into engineering and he was did not have that same access. So it was an act of uh, misogyny and he killed those women. It took years for December 6th to become proclaimed as a national day. So it, and, and only recently did people accept that it was indeed an act of misogyny. It does take time to educate people about these, uh, these moments in our history and our collective history. And so the fact that it took time for the government to proclaim this day, um, I think, really speaks to the work that many advocates and community organizations had to do to educate fellow Canadians of why this was important, as well as government officials of why it was really critical to have a permanent day on the calendar in which we remember those who passed away um, and we show that solidarity, as well as recommit, just as we do on December 6th, against misogyny, recommitting against that form of hate, also to recommit every January 29th against Islamophobia specifically, because we know that this issue did not end with, with what happened on January 29th. We've seen attacks in Toronto with the killing of Mohammed Azam's office in the fall of 2020. And sadly and heartbreakingly, we saw the terrible, tragic massacre and killing of four members of the Afzal family last June. And as you mentioned, I mean, misogyny still exists and uh, anti-Muslim racism still exists. So we have about 20 seconds left. What advice would you want to give to a Canadian Muslims or others who are watching who would like to do something to help counter this? I think the number one thing is for us to be involved uh, in, in, all, in all aspects of society and public life, whether it's in politics, whether it's in our local neighborhood associations, whether it's municipal um, efforts, we have to be present and we have to be participating and we have to be paying attention to what's going on and we have to stand up for all and the rights of everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on the show to share these thoughts with us. Thank you so much for having me, Kathy, and to your viewers. You've been watching Canadian Muslim News. If you like what we do, share, subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for our next episode. Stay safe and God bless.